I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, today's uh, talk. Um, I'm Michael Diamond. I'm the Academic Director of the Integrated Marketing and Communications Department uh, at NYU School of Professional Studies within its Division of Programs and Business. And um, I'm absolutely delighted that uh, today we have an opportunity to welcome Marion E. Brooks, who's the Vice President and U.S. Country Head of Diversity and Inclusion for Novartis. Um, he's a leader as skilled in marketing and sales as he is in training and coaching, uh, and has dedicated his uh, time uh, most recently and formally around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the event brings uh, as well uh, to the forum our own Dr. Lisa Coleman, uh, the Senior Vice President of Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation NYU. Uh, she is a much admired leader and a thought partner, partner to many of us at the university. So I want to thank her for joining as well. Um, it also goes uh, without saying perhaps that uh, a big shout out to Tariq Khan. Tariq is a member of our faculty in the Integrated Marketing and Communications Department. Um, he teaches a critical course in the students' uh, academic progression, which is a course in uh, called the C-Suite course. And it's really about uh, the expectations and behaviors of leaders in the C-suite. And I want to thank you, Tariq, particularly, as always, for curating such impactful programs for our students. Um, and it would, of course, be a missed opportunity if I didn't also remind both students and the rest of our community that today is the NYU One Day. Uh, it's a chance to celebrate um, and give back uh, to our alma mater. So I encourage you all to pop over after this to the NYU One Day uh, website and make a contribution. Anyway, without further ado, um, I turn it over to Tariq and his team uh, on the ground uh, in the classroom. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael, truly appreciate. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us for this session. Um, we are very fortunate to have uh, two very distinguished speakers. Um, and as they say in Saturday Night Live, joining live from New York City, I'm saying joining, joining live from my classroom, at NYU C-suite class, we have 25 students sitting in the classroom. Um, you may not be able to see all of them, but they are here. Um, and I wanna be very appreciative of the fact that uh, today uh, they are, the chapter that we are um, reading in the classroom is called Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, I wrote this book last year and just came out in the market. And I'm very fortunate that two of the people who have their content in the book Dr. Lisa Coleman, our own NYU, and Marion Brooks, uh, who's besides being a US head of diversity and inclusion in Novartis, uh, he's also executive coach, and he himself is an author. And I, I have known Marion for a few years as well. So just to uh, jump right into our conversation, uh, I am going to have uh, questions for both Marion and Dr. Coleman. And I wanna keep it very conversational and towards the uh, last 20 minutes, I want to dedicate it to our students who will come to the podium and actually will ask questions. So Dr. Coleman, if it's okay, may I start with you, please? Absolutely, Tarek. I'm a pleasure to be here. And of course, I'm delighted to be here with Marian. It's an honor. Thank you again. Now, you and I have had many conversations over the years about diversity and equity and inclusion. <laughs> and I first uh, and foremost, I want to congratulate you on throughout the pandemic, how well NYU has really navigated through this challenging times, but most importantly, we had some major issues when it came to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And NYU had a very bold position. And on our statement, I knew that your fingerprints were all over the place. And I think you did very well. And it's becoming a case study on how to take the right position when it comes to embracing and including diversity throughout the process. Now, coming back to my question, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is one of the most commonly used phrase in corporate America. Why would uh, a young student or a young professional should really care about it? Because the world that they live in, and especially when you're going to NYU, which is one of the most diverse uh, universities in the world, they see diversity all around themselves. Why should they care about diversity, equity, and inclusion as a business case when they're going to uh, their work life? So thank you for the question. And first of all, congratulations to you on your book. That's just amazing. And um, thank you for, of course, quoting me. I can't speak for Marion, but thanks for quoting me for sure. And uh, 
and, uh, and again, and congratulations to all the students out there. I hope you're enjoying the class, et cetera. And it's a pleasure to be here with you today. So let me just get, jump right in and say, in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, belonging, and access, we think about this from the global perspective. And so why should students be uh, paying attention to this? The future of work. I teach actually in our executive MBA program here in the Stern School of Business. And I can tell you, I have a lot of executives. My classes are over-enrolled, uh, executives returning to school to learn about diversity, equity, inclusion, the principles, how to manage the diverse workforces, how to think about nations globally, how to think about intergenerational conversations, uh, cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary conversations. If you think about Marion here, right, and his work with Novartis, uh, I say in higher education, we fill all the we feed all the fields. So pharmaceuticals and global public health, and also Tisch School of the Arts, right? And so if you think about what's happening on Broadway with diversity, equity, and inclusion, and managers, and, and new, fil uh, new productions, et cetera. Just think about the success of Hamilton and, of course, Black Panther alone. So when we think about those kinds of things, the future of work, and lastly, of course, if we think about uh, robotics, this is my background, of course, in the uh, sciences, as we know. So we think about robotics, AI, technology, all the things I think about every day, right? The future of work means that we have to have dexterity. And dexterity and nimbleness comes from, right, diverse minds, diverse thoughts, et cetera. I'll end my statement because I know I'm talking long. Uh, I want to make sure you get to Marion. Is if we changed and th thought about the GDP, just in the GDP alone for women, if we had gender equality, it, we are losing an estimated $160.2 trillion globally. And if we just adjusted, right, we could change things. So why, how do we think about the future of work and why do our students need to be thinking about this? Because we're talking about $160 million of loss, trillion dollars of lost revenue. And that doesn't even begin to talk about the people of color, people with disabilities, et cetera. So again, I'll stop there and let my, uh, let my colleague talk, but there's a lot of good work out there. And I also wanna say generations, you generations, that is where we really also need to be doing some great work. Oh, that's a great question. And I think you made a very strong business case for diversity and inclusion, just like any other segment. Um, it is really important. Um, Marianne, a question for you. Um, you have a very senior position at a you know, global conglomerate, uh, a very large company. Uh, I know particularly knowing about you and your company that you have a very strong initiative in attractive uh, diverse talent. Yes. But when you look at corporate America, um, the face of America is changing, but the face of our senior management and leadership and the boards is not changing. Um, how can a young person or a woman or a person of color who's really entering the workforce, when they look at this, uh, how can they translate this into, into a hopeful journey? And what are some of the companies doing at that level? So I think it's a, uh, an important question. It's a very important question because the next generation will be leading very soon and they will be making the decisions ultimately around how the organizations as well as our country moves forward. So I think one of the key things to remember is that diverse organizations and teams, they deliver three distinct things that more homogeneous organizations and teams do not. Higher revenues, they're more responsive to customer needs and they are more innovative. So I don't care if it's a little league team or a major corporation, you wanna deliver on those three things. And to do that, you have to have diversity at the table. And I think as you look at the leadership teams and you said like the boards are not as diverse, everyone is holding organizations more accountable now for the diversity, especially for the populations that they serve. So as a pharmaceutical company, when we look at the populations that we serve from a gender, ethnic and racial diversity, uh, people with disabilities, veterans, everyone is looking for the percentages to be reflective of the people we're serving. And if you think of it from this perspective, when you go back to those three things, the higher revenues, the innovation and the responsiveness to customer needs, you can't build something for a community that does not have them at the forefront front of what is being established. So the more you would include diversity up front, the more impactful your organization will be. And as an individual, if you're leading a team, having those diverse 
perspectives and experiences will always lead to better outcomes and solutions. Oh, great point. So Dr. Coleman, um, this is March. Last month was the Women His, you know, History Month and um, March, oh, sorry, March 8th. This is the Women History Month and March 8th was the International Women's Day. And as you know, NYU, we somehow, at least at the graduate program, I would say 80% or 75% of our students are young women. We are still um, living in the time when women are paid 82 cents for a dollar. Um, so there is gender pay parity issue. Do you believe that people of color and women and people with disabilities and uh, other categories have a competitive disadvantage when they walk into the workplace because last time I, I was having this conversation in my classroom and everybody was astounded. Uh, for example, Novartis uh, Marion's company has made a pledge, but there are many companies, a majority of large companies, they have not, um, not made a pledge to bring the pay parity, gender pay parity. Um, how do we resolve this? And you know, how do you address young women sitting in my classroom uh, for them to be more hopeful? Well, let me pick up where my colleague, uh, Marion, uh, dropped off is that, yes, so this is at a time. And so, yes, we do see competitive disadvantages, but we also see the competitive advantages. So the first thing I say is, listen, I don't have to market for uh, Novartis. I can uh, talk across companies. So if you're at a company and you find, right, that it's not sitting well with you, Right, and what I advise companies to think about these days is really think about intrapreneurship as well as entrepreneurship. Because what we know about emerging generations, as Marion mentioned, right, emerging generations will not only be our leaders, but they will come in and either support our organizations or not. And if they go out as, as entrepreneurs, then they will move outside and to their competitive advantage elsewhere. So what we have to think about is that competitive advantage internally. And some of that is about creating intrapreneurship. Some of this is happening through ERGs, for instance. We've seen some women take the lead in terms of uh, employee resource groups and business resource groups in this area. The other place in which, and I love this example from the Obama administration, because during the Obama administration, uh, Obama's a great guy, by the way. I mean, you know, this is no critique of him, but we all have our sort of, you know, places where we don't do so well. So in terms of the, uh, the leadership of the administration, what was happening is, and this sometimes happens in terms of gender, is men sometimes refer to each other. So this is what happens conversationally. Uh, I'll say something like, oh, we should think about putting solar panels on the top of some buildings. And then, Marion might say, 10 minutes later, we should think about putting some solar panels on the buildings. And then everybody says, oh my gosh, Marion, that is just an incredible idea. Where did you come up with that idea? <laughs> wow, let's, 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 let's delve into that deeper. And then there, this conversation is shoes and so the credit. So what the Obama administration did was the women in the Obama administration developed what they called a referential system. And so they bonded together. And so anytime a woman's idea came up, they would reference each other. In other words, they created a network or a posse is what I like to call it, right? So the second thing I say is create your network and create your posse because then, and whether that's internally or externally, so they can provide you with the right advice, the right referential. So in the Obama administration, when Mary said something, then Susie would say, Hey, no, John, that wasn't your idea. Hey, Mary, could you exp explain your idea more? So those networks, and then lastly, I would say, is develop the right partnerships. Go get coaching, get the networks outside so that you can develop yourself professionally. Self-advocacy is actually really important. And sometimes, pat particularly for people like myself who are introverts, et cetera, I know I don't seem like one, but I am. Um, we, we don't think that self-advocacy is really um, important, et cetera. Sometimes we think our work, if we do our work, it'll just be seen magically and we'll be taken out of the corner and appointed to be a CEO. That's not how it works. And so self-advocacy is really important and to develop those networks and posses so that they can mention your names as sponsors in the rooms, et cetera. Well, that's a great point. And I think you give a great hope that now, especially the, the young millennials and the Gen Zs who will be entering the workforce um, more, uh, they clearly decide 
the choice of the company based on the company's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And they hold companies liable. For, for them, it's less important that, you know, what brand name the company has, but more important is what position the company is taking. And there are companies um, that are really attracting more women and um, you know, people of color to workforce, and which is wonderful. Um, Marion, in the book, you write three important elements of uh, DEI. And I think you explain it well, but I'd rather let you explain it better. You talk about, you know, start with the numbers, then let's talk about the unconscious biases, and then uh, establish some hiring guidelines, working and leveraging your uh, employee resources group or BRG's business resources group. Can you elaborate on that? That, you know, what is your three point strategy if a company wants to manage the whole process of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, so Tariq, I started with Novartis 22 years ago. And when I started with the organization, it was very rare to see a woman director or vice president. But at one point, the organization committed to ensuring that we were investing, supporting, and also developing our female talent to prepare them for the next level. And what we did is we went back to what I was referencing earlier. We looked at the populations that we served, and then we looked at our leadership teams. And we're saying populations are pretty much 50% female, but we only have about 20% or 10% females in leadership. And so we developed programs that address that. So starting with those numbers, and when we look at the ethnic and racial diverse uh, groups as well, we're looking at those numbers and the uh, census data lets us know available talent that's out there in the market for specific roles. And we're able to look at those numbers and say, okay, as Novartis, when we look at these roles at this level, this is what the market has. This is how we are represented with Novartis. Here is the gap. Now let's create opportunities and programs to attract or develop our talent internally. So that's what I mean by starting with the numbers. And uh, I'm a marketing and sales guy at heart. So it always starts and ends with the numbers. And then the next thing that we have to do is we have to remove the unconscious bias. So one of the things that I did when I started in this role in 2019 is we established hiring guidelines. So there's research that shows that if you only have one woman or one person of color in a candidate pool, they statistically have no chance of receiving an offer because of confirmation bias. So if there are all men, from the same type of university and one female, the confirmation bias in our heads is that, well, obviously a man is the best choice. Just by adding one additional qualified female to that candidate pool, it goes up to over 50% that one of the, uh, the person that is selected would be female. So we incorporated hiring guidelines that require diversity on the interviewing panels, gender and ethnically racial diversity, as well as in the candidate slates. And what we've seen with that is that the numbers have increased significantly as far as diverse candidates getting a fair chance to compete for roles. So that's the actual component around the hiring guidelines. And then our employee resource groups. Uh, I led our African Ancestry Employee Resource Group here at Novartis back in 2010 through 2014. And it gave me an opportunity to demonstrate my leadership and my skills on another level. At that point, I was an associate director, but I ended up with the CEO and CFO as mentors and ultimately sponsors because of the great work that we were doing in the employee resource group for our African-American associates, but also for all associates. So I don't build programs and I've never built things for just one group. I build things that are going to be beneficial, like development and training and programs that are going to be beneficial to all associates and anyone who is interested has an opportunity. By being inclusive, you actually create opportunities for yourself and for others. So those are the three principles. That's the way that I approach uh, any effort or any gap that we have. Let's start with the numbers. Let's identify the biases and deal with that. And then let's make sure that we have an inclusive opportunity for everyone to participate, learn, and grow. Well said, well said. Dr. Coleman, you, you wrote in my book as well, and we all been making a case for a very long time that underrepresented communities are not the problem. They are actually our assets. Now, 
women or people of color sitting in the classroom or uh, joining us via Zoom, how can you translate this to them that when they go for a job interview or at their workplace, how can they convert their diversity into an asset for the company? What message should they be communicating with a prospective employer or their current employer that, hey, being a woman, I could probably be more valuable for what you're trying to do? Great question again, Tarek. So uh, when we think about this idea, you know, of the assets, right, to the organizations. And so the quote that I have that you're mentioning is, and this is something I've said a lot, when I wake up in the morning or when I look at my team or I look at the diverse teams with whom I work, I don't look out and see a problem, right? Like, as I'm brushing my teeth, I don't say, oh, there's the problem. Oh, there she is today. Goodness gracious, right? And so actually what I see are assets, opportunities, and the future. So when I look at Generation Z, I see assets. And now far too often what we see across generations is generations will badmouth other generations, right? That's the problem. The baby boomers are the problem. Gen Z is the problem. Generation X is the problem, right? Everybody's the problem. So I think the first thing we need to do is reimagine who and what the problem is. So I think that's the first thing. And we do that through the business cases and the cases that you talked about. So in higher education, we have to think about multiple cases, right? The business case, the healthcare case, the, uh, the, the arts case, et cetera. And then really think about what those assets might be. So on Broadway, representation, right? In healthcare, look at what happened during COVID. Look at the different implications that happened across the world. What if we actually worked with global communities, then maybe we wouldn't have the spread that we did. We know cancer, right, melanoma, uh, all right, appears differently with on, on people who have brown skin. We know heart disease manifests its difference in men and women, but if we only study male cadavers, then what do we get? We get misinformation about then heart disease and women have greater uh, rates of dying. So no matter where you are bringing that expertise, and that's how we, in terms of the business case, think about that expertise. And as I said, it might be the business case for all areas. I think the second, way is to think about, and this goes back to what Marion was talking about, is critical mass. We know that what we need to actually identify trends is critical mass. One person gets pushed out, two people get pitted against each other, so you need three people to create critical mass, three women out of, let's say, 10. Why do you want to do that? Because what you're trying to do is create cultures of belonging, and cultures of belonging can only happen if you have critical mass where people can debate ideas out with debate ideas without getting pushed out. But if I'm just one individual and I bring something forward, I will get pushed out of the organization or the leadership because I'm different, I'm outside of that. So really thinking about assets as critical mass. And I think joining organizations to go back to your former question where you know there is critical mass. I think the last thing I'll say here as assets, and this has to do with trends, and I think a lot about new generations. This is the most time, most diverse time in our workforces in global history. That's across all of our workforces from Pakistan and, and Zimbabwe to New Zealand to the United States. That's where we are right now. And so thinking about these trends, then presenting right the fact that as, as members of these new generations, et cetera, we know more about diversity because actually we know from research growing up in a multicultural environment actually provides you with more information, dexterity, et cetera. And so as a result, then you will be able to think about the trends. And this is my phrase. Nobody wants to be Blockbuster, Hertz, or Alta Vista. And if you don't know who those places are, that's the point because they don't exist anymore, right? But if people had delved into other generations, had talk, talked across socioeconomic differences, Blockbuster, the taxi system, et cetera, might look different, to, different today if they had done that sort of cross-pollination with diverse individuals. So trends, transparency, measurement, and then thinking about these ideas of, of course, critical mass in terms of leadership. No, great point. Uh, the coding codec moment didn't last too long, right? Um, <laughs> right, people don't even know. Remember, I mean, they don't even know. We're reinventing the Polaroid now, Terry. I mean, yeah, it's just. Yeah. It's, it's a shame. It's an Amazon world. Uh, Mary and I, I'm, I'm going to uh, carry on in the similar question. Um, Lisa has made a very strong case that, hey, it's a business case. At the end of the day, this is a better business opportunity, and you know it very well. Many companies are not still leveraging the 
the diverse talent and women into the workforce. Um, what advice do you have for young professional students? You know, when they go to work tomorrow or when they go to a, their interview next week, how can they bring this asset that Lisa, Dr. Lisa Coleman talked about, how can they bring that into the conversation uh, tangentially that it really becomes more impactful that, you know, when you are dealing with a person of color or a woman or a person with disabilities, it's like buy one, get one free. You're paying for a data scientist, but what you're getting is the cultural knowledge that I'm bringing into uh, the, the organization. How can they start that conversation? So in those types of situations, I like to ask questions versus make statements. So if I was a young person going into one of those situations, whether I'm at work or I'm you know, interviewing with an organization, I would ask questions such as, well, what is the representation of women in your leadership as well as people of color in the different demographics? So asking those types of questions and then asking, okay, so those numbers sound low are they so what are the programs what is the commitment that the organization is making to move forward and i would love to be a part of the solution so now you've asked the question now you've asked what they're doing and now you've offered yourself as a part of the solution moving forward and i, I like to approach it in that way because if you start to make statements then you can actually put have people put up their defenses. But if you ask questions, they will reveal the truth to you, and then you can identify an opportunity to be part of the solution moving forward. Uh, the other thing I would say, and Dr. Coleman has spoken about this a few times, is to really evaluate the organizations and their culture. You can go to Glassdoor and get a sense. You can talk to people within the organization. I would encourage every young person. I have um, four girls, uh, my daughter and my three nieces that I raised. My daughter's the youngest. She just turned 25 on Sunday. And I encourage them to ask for references from the people they were interviewing for people working at the company right now so they could get a real sense of what the true story is versus just what they see on the website. And my daughter turned down two jobs um, because she didn't feel right with the culture. And then when she spoke to people, she felt like they were scared to tell her the truth and she didn't want to be in an environment where the truth was not being told. And so those are some of the tips that I would offer uh, to the young people today. You all have a lot of power. We're all looking at you. We're looking at the percentages of Gen Z's and millennials that are coming in in our internship programs that are in our organization. So that you guys hold a lot of power. Leverage it effectively. No, oh, great, great point, uh, Dr. Coleman. Uh, when we look at NYU, you know, forty-two thousand plus students, faculty. We, we are just like any other large organization in the world. Um, let's reflect back on the pandemic. You know, it was a very challenging times. And I think the companies were more known for what they did not do than what they did do, right? Um, and I'm talking about major incidents like Black Lives Matter or hate crimes against Asian American. Uh, NYU had, had a very bold position before any other organizations, you know, and this was not a playbook or lesson for only the academic world, but I think for corporate America globally as well. Uh, you know, what, what's your method to the madness, uh, how you approach this and how you really navigated through those challenging times and taking a position on things that really matter to most people. Um, so what advice do you have for companies and organizations, even academics, uh, who probably could have done it better and differently. So this goes back to something that Mary was saying earlier about the assessment of organizations that we both reference, right, in terms of thinking about where you are. And one of the other things that I say about the organization is, where is your organization and your leadership, depending on where you sit in the organization, so it could be a management team, on the learning cycle, right? So when we think about the six C's of inclusive leadership that have come out of Deloitte, right? One of the six C's is around cognizance, right? So that cognition point is around then, to some degree, where are you in the learning cycle? Are you a learning organization? Where does learning occur in your organization? I always say that, you know, curiosity, learning, those are things that allow, right, high, something like an NYU. And remember, higher education institutions, I love us, but we profess a lot. 
we don't necessarily always learn. We produce research. That doesn't always mean we invite it back in. Here at NYU, we try to do that. So in those cases, right, then how are you bringing that learning back into the organization? So that's what we try to do. So the first thing is to bring the learning and then assess where that learning needs to happen across the organization, because it's not going to be the same across all areas. The second is the appetite for innovation. Right, what we know is people talk about innovation, but the appetite for innovation at banks is different than the appetite for innovation often at a place like Novartis, right? Because they have different people, different boards that they to which and to whom they have to answer. So on this innovation cycle, where are you and how can you test the boundaries? And so I always say, right, here at, when I was at Harvard, we created an app. At NYU, we're working on an app. Right, because I can bring engineers together with Broadway people and business people to create all kinds of things. But I know that we're in an innovative space. What I say is when I've worked at, and I'll just use this as an example, I worked at Tufts, Harvard, and now NYU. I worked for a giraffe, a bear, and a panther. The same species, but very different animals. And so, right, that's how you have to know. The giraffe is kind of reaching the air, the bear is a bear, and the panther is sleek, and black in the night, it might take over your neighborhood. So, right, so these are, right, the differences as we think about these institutions. And so again, thinking about that culture will also help you think about innovation. And the last area, I think, is to really then think about these issues around measurement, evaluation, measurement, data collection, et cetera. We actually pay attention to data, what, where, and I always say, it, I have two columns if I don't have any other columns, the data, and then where I'm getting the money, the financial column and the data column. Those are the two columns because I want them to light up. And so again, when we're thinking about organizations and um, different types of organizations, really asking those hard questions about the fiscal responsibilities. Because I run into a lot of chief diversity officers who don't have budgets, they don't have staff, they don't have anything. And I'm like, chief of, is that the same as the chief of marketing? Is that the same as the chief of sustainability? Is that the same as the chief IT officer? And so that's how we have to sort of think about how we're imagining these roles to go back to even some of the things that Marion was saying. Because one of the things that I ask often is, if I'm the chief and there are other chiefs, let's look at how all the other chiefs line up and let's make sure we're all aligned appropriately across the organization. I think uh, Dr. Coleman, you're disturbing a lot of leaders with that question that you have given me the title of chief, but what are the resources? And that clearly demonstrate your commitment to that. Um, that's a good thing. And, and I'm going to use this now in speaking to the leaders. Um, Marion, coming to you uh, now, I want you to put your executive coach hat on. Um, <laughs> and what advice do you have to these young professionals or students? Um, when I was at their age, I, I never even thought about leadership, right? And, and we have talked about that, that leaders are born and made, it's a combination. Yes. Um, and a lot of them really don't know that they have the re leadership traits. Uh, what advice do you have that how they can prepare to be better leaders of tomorrow? What are some of the things that they can pay attention to? Well, the first thing I would say is to do the job that you've been hired to do. So I see a lot of people that want to get promoted, um, but are not focused on excellence in what the, they have already been given. And so first thing is do the job that you've been assigned to do and do it with excellence. And then also make sure that you stay, uh, as Dr. Coleman was saying, a continuous learner. So for me, I'm ultimately trying to learn in every environment that I'm in. Like today, I've written a number of notes from what Dr. Coleman has already said, because I want to continue to grow and develop. So stay committed to your development. And everyone should have a career or development plan. I don't care what level you are in an organization. And you need to identify the strengths that you have, you know, three to four strengths one to two areas of opportunity, and then what are the actions that you are taking to make sure that you are developing in those areas of opportunity? And the part that I left out is, what is your target? Your target might change. So what is your short-term career target? What is your long-term career target? And those areas of opportunity should be aligned to helping you be prepared on day one to execute with excellence in those roles. The last thing I will say is to make sure that you are investing in other people. 
People invest in people they see investing in other people. So you want to do your job. You want to stay continuously focused on learning and developing yourself. And then you want to invest in other people. And employee resource groups or business resource groups are a great way to do that. But you have to invest in other people. You will learn and you will help other people learn. So all the boats will rise together. Great. Um, I have one more question for each of you, and then I'll turn to my students and ask them to ask you questions. Um, and I have the same questions for you. So Marianne, you may have an advantage of preparing more time for this question. But um, so Dr. Coleman, um, how can anyone sitting in my classroom or on the Zoom can become Dr. Lisa Coleman? Oh, don't do that. <laughs> That's not a good advice. <laughs> I know, I know it's not. Okay, so this is what I'll say. Uh, and this goes back to something that Marion was saying. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there were no chief diversity officers, actually, as it turns out. There were, there were in some cases, chief affirmative action officers. There were different kinds of officers 25 years ago. So the first thing I would say is take the risks. Figure out your comfort zone for taking risks. Because taking risks, and I, and I say this because you have to figure out your comfort zone. Because for instance, when I first started this, I'm a traditionally trained academic. So traditionally trained academics were not encouraged to go into diversity work. We're encouraged to do research, to be faculty members, to be other things. And so when this first emerged, some of the people around me said, Lisa, are you crazy? This is, this is, this is going nowhere. What are you thinking? And so now laugh, you know, laugh, last laugh with them, but with me, but right. So the first thing is to take the risk. The second, I think, is to figure out your triggers. Those things that bug you, get under your skin and can take you off your path, right? For, because for a lot of us, they're things that sometimes make us upset to go back to something that Marion was saying, right? So maybe we're hired to do one job, but then there's something that's bugging us. And that's why we keep gravitating toward this other thing, but then we're not necessarily, right, focused on what we might, should be focused on. So figure out your triggers because your triggers matter. For instance, go back to that Obama example I used. One of my triggers used to be men talking over me. Early in my career, I did not react well to that. And so I would say I've refined the way that I would react to that now as, uh, as, as contrasted to when I was in certainly my 20s. The last I would say is mistakes, recovery and resilience. One of the things is I've made a lot of mistakes along the way, right? But I'm a learner. To go back to what Marion was saying, I'm a learner, I'm curious, I'm always trying to learn and think about things. So when I think about the employer, I employ design thinking a lot. I'm really interested in how do we think in the processes of iteration, which means I can fail and reiterate. And design thinking starts with empathy. So I want to start with empathy and radical empathy, right? Seeing where others are coming from. There's that phrase, do unto others as you would do unto yourself. I like to say, do unto others as you, as they would like that to be done to or unto, right? Because we have to understand where other people are coming from, not just from our own vantage point and particularly in global context. So that's where I'll end is really saying, in terms of if you wanna be uh, come Lisa Coleman, then we really also have to think about these global contexts because all I've done is spent most of my life trying to look across the globe and figure out all of the differences therein and blend that together so that we can uplift each other in equitable systems and work together through more collaboration. So the last thing is collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Because without good teams, without collaboration, um, actually, you know, the only reason I get to do all the videos that you've even referenced earlier, Tarek, during, um, during COVID and, uh, I, you know, International Women's Day, I got to interview Solange Knowles, right? Some people were there for that, right? But that was a team effort. That wasn't because of me. That was because of a team effort that we created, that we were allowed and able to work in partnership and collaboration and continue those partnerships and collaborate. Great point. And um, one quick 15 second anecdotal story for you. When I was offered the first kind of a CDO position 20 some years ago, um, it was recommended that I should report to legal. <laughs> and I, I exactly. didn't understand that. 
And then they negotiated to HR and I said, no. And they said, where do you want to be in finance? I said, no, marketing. And they said, why would marketing be looking after something? But now that's a long story for all of us. And uh, I will say this, I, to Rick, let me just say this one last thing. I teach negotiation and actually uh, taught, I teach it in the Hampton Business School, et cetera. And so negotiation, another piece that I didn't mention, I'm, I hope Marion will talk a little bit about that, but, but thinking about negotiation and how you negotiate, I have never reported to anyone but the president. Great point. Yeah, that's where you should be. Okay, Marion, I know as, as difficult as it may sound for many people, but how can one become the Marion Brooks? Well, Dr. Coleman, I was listening to her and I was like, we share so many synergies in the way that we approach things. So I, I would build on the component around the emotional intelligence, around how you react to situations. So responding versus reacting. So that's something that I had to learn throughout my career because we all have our triggers and we can show up. And there are some, I ask people when I do my emotional intelligence workshops, why do you think some very smart people don't have the careers that they would like to have? They're brilliant, but they don't have successful careers. And the thing that came back, they interviewed uh, like 10,000 CEOs and they asked them this question. And they said their inability to take feedback and their inability to manage their emotions. And so very smart people that are not succeeding because they can't manage that component. And 80% of success based on the research is based on emotional intelligence, only 20% on IQ. So think of it this way, there are a lot of smart people out there, but not a lot of emotionally intelligent people. So I tell everyone, no matter how brilliant you are, work on your emotional intelligence. The other thing I would say is chase experiences and development of skills, not titles. I have seen people go for titles that they wanted, they get the title, but they hadn't prepared themselves for success in that role and they failed miserably. So make sure that whatever you're doing is that you're not chasing job titles, you are uh, gathering experiences that will prepare you for success in whatever role or whatever career you are looking for. Now, I know a lot of the young people are saying right now, I don't really know what I want to do ultimately. Some of you may be thinking that. Set a target, start growing towards that, and I can tell you the avenues will start to open. Five years ago, you could have never told me that I would be uh, the VP and US country head of diversity and inclusion. I was a sales and marketing guy. That was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be the, C, uh, the uh, head of sales and marketing for the organization globally. And then I started working in DNI. And then I started to uh, engage with different people outside of the organization. And I wrote the book. And the organization came to me and said, with everything that you've done on the commercial side of the business, and now all of the work that you've done in DNI, and now the book, we feel you are the perfect person to help us blend DNI into the DNA of Novartis versus DNI being over here and the business being over there. And so those experiences that I built over my career led me to this point. And, and the last part um, that I will share is purpose work. So I'm doing purpose work now. Uh, and I got clear on what my purpose was and I was able to make decisions that aligned with my purpose. And now I wake up every day uh, doing what I'm on the planet to do for myself and for others. And now I'm gonna to turn to the students uh, before I do that. Uh, towards the end, Michael Diamonds would come in closing. Uh, I know that people who are joining us via Zoom, they may not have, they may not be able to put their question in chat box, but they can go to Q&A and put their questions. And Michael, if you can look at them uh, or have your own questions to ask Marion in the last five minutes and Dr. Coleman. So let me invite the students who wants to come up and um, ask questions. Um, we have 10 minutes for the students, so let's see. And please introduce yourself and ask your question. Hi, my name is Clara. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. So my question is, you mentioned throughout the conversation that diversity should be leveraged as one of the key drivers for success and innovation. So in that sense, don't you think like 
that DEI should be treated with the same discipline as a unique department like R&D, marketing, IT, et cetera? And how would that look like according to you? I'll go first. So absolutely, and um, uh, Tariq said it as well, and Dr. Coleman, that you have to invest. So you invest the money in what's important. So if you are saying that DENI is just as important to the DNA of your organization as research, as sales, as marketing, or any other IT, any other department, it should be uh, funded at the same level. So here at Novartis, when I started in this role back in 2019, there were only three people in, uh, in DENI in the US. Now we have a team of 12. Uh, so the organization put their money where their mouth is and we operate and I sit on the same boards as all of the other chief officers uh, in the organization to make decisions that impact everyone because if it's a part of everything, you should have a seat at the table where all of the decisions are being made. Dr. Coleman, anything you want to add? Yeah, agreed. And I'll just say uh, agree, agree, agree. And also that as we think about this, we should be thinking about uh, diversity and inclusion and access belonging when we know words continue the nomenclature continues we need to be thinking about it as a growth field right just like we think about it or marketing field sustainability fields where we can make mistakes we can recover etc i say this a lot i work in abu dhabi and we have the ministries of possibility and if i were to create a ministry it'd be the ministry of mistakes recovery and resilience right and so to really think about that piece i think is really important because far too often what we see is if a diversity effort fails within an organization then people are like oh well all diversity fails but if we treat it like other things within the organization right we know computers fail and so as a result we have to we have to make adjustments or marketing uh marketing plans fail and then we have to make adjustments so i think to think of it as a growth field is also really crucial as we think about treating it similarly not just on the fiscal side but also in that growth uh, thank you so much both okay uh hello my name is lulu uh, I appreciate today's uh, conversation. Uh, we've learned a lot from this today's uh, conversation. It's uh, give us a lot of coverage for young professional, especially the women professional. And uh, actually I have a question for uh, Marion uh, because I've seen you written a book called uh, what, if, uh, what You Never Know Is Hurting You. And uh, it mentions the career, uh, clear, uh, clear career road mapping. Can you give us three suggestions about uh, how to determine our career path? Because some, uh, actually, I have been working many years, but I all, but I still confused about my career development. So, can you give us some suggestions? Thank you. Yes, I can give you a couple of tips. So. First thing I would say is get clear on what you're passionate about. So what do you do today in your current job or outside of work that gets you up, that you can do when you're tired, right? When you can do when you're frustrated, but something that uh, gives you energy and really figure out what that thing is and then start to think about how you could actually apply that more effectively in your current role or look for opportunities with other companies or, or outside of the organization with nonprofits and things of that sort. Once you get focused on your purpose work, uh, and I, I said this before, once you get focused on your purpose work, things start to fall into place. So you may not need, you need to do an and versus an or. So I tell people sometimes you can have a full-time job and have your passion over here, but make sure that you focus on what that passion is and then build that back into your career journey. Uh, thank Does you. that resonate with you? Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. One more question, maybe somebody wants to ask. <clears throat> okay, they have a midterm today. So you know, understand the nervousness, but those questions, both of them were better than the question that I asked. Uh, before I turn to um, Michael, I have a question for uh, both 
uh, Marianne and Dr. Coleman. These students probably will be graduating next year with their master's degree. And the work environment and the workplace has changed. I sometimes predict that nobody will work for one company. Um, how the companies uh, are engaging the changing workforce. I had somebody with me who has started working two years ago and I was coaching her. I asked her that, hey, once the companies go back to the full-time office, um, how would you like it? She said, I'll quit. And I thought that, that was funny and arrogant answer. And I said, what do you mean you'll quit? She said, no, there are not companies that will hire me working remotely and that's how I wanna work for the rest of my life. Um, now, someone, some of these people, I hate to say that, probably have 40 or 50 years of career ahead of them. Um, what advice do you have as they go into the workplace how to adapt into the changing environment. Dr. Coleman, you work very closely with the students. So I'll start with you and then Marion, same, same question for you. Well, the first I will say is, I think it's both and. I think organizations, um, they think they're gonna go back to the, uh, what I keep hearing this new normal or the old normal. And I actually wrote an article about that's not gonna happen. We need to think about the new different, how we're gonna do things differently. So we're gonna see hybridized workforces, et cetera. But to answer your question, I think that students, what, we, what you're talking about is flexibility. And what we know is that as we go through our, and this is what to some degree Marion has already talked about, right? Is that even in the answering to the uh, other questions about how do you think about skill development, you have the arc of your career, the arc of leadership, right? Is about flexibility, nimbleness, and the ability to be a learner. So in those spaces, then how are you thinking about that flexibility and nimbleness Right, so that if you have your passion on one side and you have your job, let's say that's where you are now, right? How do you think about that flexibility in terms of that movement across time? And some of that is related to transfer of skills. One of the things that I say a lot is if, uh, the way I art articulate my resume today, right? is very different than I would have done it earlier. And so now my job as a barista is the job that I had where I learned about technology in relation to coffee production, right? So how we think about this transfer of skills and the narration of the transfer of skills relates to what Marion has been talking about because we can have lots of different positions, as you've just said, across the course of our life. But how do we articulate those skills then, right? Then I can say, well, that taught me something about science and the production of this. And it also gave me about serving customers and emotional intelligence and working across groups and thinking about managing teams, right? That takes that job in the coffee shop to a whole other level. <laughs> it was just a job in the coffee shop, right? But so, so then thinking about how we do that and let alone in the early parts of our positions. And so uh, early positions that we have, how do we think about those articulations and then creating that narrative Right, that as we go into our organization so that they can be flexible and nimble, but then we can be flexible and nimble with the organizations. And lastly, don't forget about intrapreneurship. Again, this intrapreneurship I think is really crucial because far too often what we're seeing is just entrepreneurship. And one of the things we've been working on with companies like even Zoom or Disney, et cetera, is this idea of intrapreneurship, uh, particularly in the research and development area. Great. Uh, Marion, can I quickly get your response as well before I turn back to Michael? Yes, so at Novartis, we call it choice with responsibility. Uh, and it's the responsibility component. I uh, agree with Dr. Coleman. I don't know if we in any near term uh, situation will go back to what we were doing before, but how do we manage the new normal? But the key thing is, is being able to communicate. Okay, I don't want to come back into the office, but being able to articulate to the leader that you're speaking to about what you are going to do to be able to deliver above the basic of the expectations for the role that you're doing. So I don't think it's just a, okay, if you're going back to the office, I'm not going to go. It's saying, hey, I want to remain remote. Like for me personally, I live in Los Angeles. My office is in New Jersey. I come once a month to New Jersey um, and I work, but I'm able to deliver. And I've laid out a plan with all of the senior uh, administrators, the president of the country, and we've aligned on and I deliver the results. So I would say think of it from that perspective, uh, not just a hard no. That's number one. And then number two, 
there are a lot of organizations that are aligned with uh, a more remote working. Identify those organizations, but make sure culturally that you will be able to grow in those organizations uh, if you choose them. Great, thank you. Michael, back to you, uh, Dr. Coleman, Mr. Brooks, thank you so much. It's always an honor and a privilege to be with you in the same space or same screen. So thank you very much for your time. Michael? Yeah, well, I, um, I think I just got a wonderful dose of that continued learning and lifetime learning from the last hour. Absolutely amazing. I think it's probably one of the most impactful and engaging conversations we've had in a, a long series of conversations that faculty have helped uh, moderate. And I, I want to thank you both tremendously for that. Um, you know, I, I captured really some very powerful things about the business case uh, for diversity, to, you know, this notion that diversity delivers. And, and also this, I think, very, very healthy recognition and, 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 and sense of self-empowerment uh, for our emerging young professionals that we teach at the school. Uh, I think you said, Marion, you all have a lot of power. We're all looking at you. And I think that's counsel that we often share with our students. You know, there's, they have a lot more to contribute than they perhaps sometimes worry about when they initially hit the job market and, um, you know, are worried about how much they have to add. And I think, you know, just a, a wonderful set of very insightful, practical, pragmatic approaches to, you know, building a, a life plan and thinking about transferable skills and, 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 you know, these ideas of ERGs or entrepreneurships and, you know, a lot of, a lot of these things candidly are probably good counsel to any young professional of whatever color or stripe, you know, that really is the sort of foundations of success in so many respects and both academic, I would argue, and professional to be intellectually curious and find the culture and create the culture more importantly. So um, absolutely tremendous. I, um, this is very much, uh, I couldn't think of a better example of what we strive for at the School of Professional Studies, you know, to bring together academics and, and professionals um, around really important topics, but that are applied, you know, that are about uh, individuals, professional life and progress and growth. So uh, you inspired as me as much as anyone. So I thank you both for that. And Tariq, as always, um, uh, as always, Tariq, uh, just a, a beautifully moderated and wonderfully curated event. So thank you very much. And thanks to our students. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Take care. Yes. Well, if you can hear, they're all applauding for you, which is wonderful. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Robin. And thank you, Dr. Coleman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Brooks. Have a great day. Okay. Thanks, everyone.